Uh, good afternoon, you all. Uh, uh, congratulations, too, on uh, the process, whole process. I know you all su submitted applications, and since it was a grant, it wasn't like uh, Kristen's thing where she's letting a lot contact her. You get in. She, where she just starting off, but uh, with this, Mary, I'm going to let her know early on. Everybody can't come. Uh, so <laughs> congratulations for uh, being there. That's on my mind a lot because I uh, am directing the NEH Summer Institute. And I was telling Mary Emma that she didn't tell me one of the hardest parts about it is when you have to send those rejection letters. And uh, I don't have a Sarah, because if I had a Sarah, I would have had Sarah send out my different letters. <laughs> anyway, so uh, just real quickly, we're going to talk about just a little of the history of how we got here, which is uh, uh, how we got here. And one of those for me started with African American poetry. Uh, I just really, I started a blog some years ago, and I was just really trying to figure out a way to showcase some of my blog entries and uh, showcase what I had in my collection, that is, uh, in my personal collection. And what I discovered early on, if you're dealing with poets, is, boy, they come at you if you don't include them. So I included about 25 to 50 poets in my first data set. And I mean, before I hit publish, uh, poets were contacting me, it felt like, saying, why is my name on the list? So then I built it up to 75, and then I got a nice round number at 100. And I felt like that was a good number. So I had 100 poets that I was looking at, and I was looking at their books, and I was just writing about those over and over my blog. Uh, Kenton at the time started trying to think about developing a project, and one of the things I told him, hey, don't start at 25, don't do 50, because they'll come after you, don't do 75, start at 100. And so he did this thing called the 100 Novels. And so we were kind of uh, uh, doing our sibling thing, going back and forth, talking about here's 100 poems, poets, here's 100 novels. Uh, and that's how we really started. started. And then somehow Mary Emma got in on that and it grew into what we're doing now. So that's really uh, how that whole thing came about. And so we're just going to say a little bit about some of the projects we're doing today, and then uh, we'll take questions. Yeah, you know, one other thing I want to say, particularly when we're talking about this 100 novels project, which later evolved into the Black Book, is I want to be very clear. I always had an advantage because I was able to talk back and forth with my brother, brainstorm back and forth with him. So these things are very important in terms of how I even conceived and got to this point of starting the project. Actually, even when thinking about this, we started with metadata, and that goes back to Harlem, New York, in the summer, where I saw the summer of 2009. It was this lady, you all, that came in, kind of like had this afro. She said it was this thing like, DH is happening. I don't know what it is, but I have these resources <laughs> in Kansas to train you in it if you want to. Of course, that was her right here. <laughs> so literally, like, you know how Bill Self was big on recruiting? She was big on recruiting me from that summer in New York when we were working on Digital Summer. Now, the point of Digital Schumberg was to collect all of this metadata about the various collections in order to basically make the collections um, accessible to online users. Because, you know, the Schumberg boasts of being this place, you know, the, the repository of Black culture. But oftentimes people do not make it up to Harlem to actually get to the actual center to actually access the archives and these things. So we started thinking, how much information can we combine about these things? to make it more accessible, not just there being a novel, but a novel published with a novel about this various thing. This is how we conceived of this. Another thing I really want to talk about, because people get forgetting when this process gets a little longer, Goylan Williams and Crystal Bolson were very instrumental early on in 2011. February 11, 2011 is when we really got rolling with all of this. And I want to say in terms of collecting info, I mean, it's 2019, and we even take for granted how much Google has evolved over the past nine years in terms of searching things. One of the reasons we started the HBW blog was because we just could not find Google hits on Black Novelist online. That was one of the original reasons. And again, we were just trying to, again, compile metadata. Now, I want to start where I am now at the University of Texas at Arlington as a professor who, again, is so much in, so very interested in metadata. Um, I hang out in the library a lot, as I did even starting at Kansas, you know, working with Brian Rosenblum, who's very instrumental to this project as well. But um, I want to start thinking about where I am in 2019 and how the Black 100 Novels Project, the Black Book Project, got me to this actual thing. So um, I want to canvas to see, I want, as, a, as a graduate student, I want to focus on African-American short fiction. The problem is, as Howard already pointed out, everybody has a short story writer that they want you to cover. 
you know, everybody is saying this person, this person, that person. So the first thing I wanted to do was, who are the most frequently anthologized Black writers? So I canvassed 100 anthologies. And I came up with this concept of calling the Big Seven. That is Charles Chestnut, Zillner Hurston, Richard Wright, Ralph Ellison, James Baldwin, Tony K. Bambara, and Alice Walker. By a numerical standpoint, these are the most frequently anthologized Black writers in anthologies. Now, 100 uh, anthologies, you might say, why did I only pick 100 anthologies? Well, that was a stretch from thinking about actually finding publications that included Black writers. That was a big stretch that I want to point out to begin with. So, with this being said, I created this data visualization in order to kind of sift through and visualize in one particular visualization the history of African American short fiction. Now, I am going to ask a few questions in terms of this. Looking at this again. You can minimize, minimize that. Minimize this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, cool. This points out the various seven writers that I'm talking about. Um, within this, I haven't broken down my anthology. Hold on. Oh, what? It's eight. Oh, oh sorry. Eight, eight, eight. I'm sorry. I want to say this. One thing about anthologies, there are eight. The reason Langston Hughes is included is because oftentimes anthologies include his simple stories. However, not one of his simple stories has been anthologized more than three times. So while he does rank in how many 42 stories, he doesn't have one story anthologized more than two or three times. So I didn't necessarily focus on him as one of the big seven writers. Now, looking at this, I divided this by anthology types, American anthologies, African-American literature anthologies, Harlem Renaissance anthologies, short story collections, African-American short story collections. What type of information, how do you all think I collected? Publication data. Say more about that. Like, what, what do you mean publication? Yes, when it was published, uh, probably look at it, the introduction in terms of what the idea was. When was published? What year? What was happening during that year? Uh, and the authors. Where did I get that info? Though, how did I get it? Oh, <laughs> what's up? Reverse citation. Yeah, citation in there. Hmm. Or just you, you do your standard Google search, like you say. <laughs> How many? Well, that's interesting, just because I mean, I just know this for experience. Try to Google anthologies. If it's not the Norton, maybe call and response, Rivers, like you, it's just pretty hard to find What's that? I was going to say Google, but Yeah, but the thing is surprising. And this is the thing. Yeah, you would think that would be so simple. But no, they don't even have a lot. Google does not have a lot of anthologies by black writers online. That's just it. Out of all the books in Google Books, <laughs> you really cannot find just a table of contents of anthologies to feature black writers. Literally, how did I, Jade, how did I do this? <laughs> <laughs> we uh, transcribe on <laughs> Now, I know people saying, oh, use OCR software, do this, this, this. No, it didn't work. It didn't work. Everybody, the typeface font was so different in these types of things. And then there were so many inaccuracies in the table of contents themselves. That just didn't work. That just did not work. But the one thing that I want to point out is we were able to indeed create a record of. Oh, I can't see. We were indeed able to create and publish a record of metadata about 100 anthologies that include short fiction. Now, again, this just looks like a spreadsheet to you all, and this is one visualization that we created as a result. One of the reasons that we were so uh, uh, convinced, and I want to say we, because I work with two of my graduate assistants, uh, Jay Harrison and Rebecca Newsom, and we've actually published this to the Texas Data Repository so anybody can uh, access this info. We were thinking about sustainability. How can we create a project that someone else might be able to come after us and recreate the same project with the same types of results? That's what we were focused on in this. Now, the reason why I want to talk about this in terms of how I organize this metadata is because the info that you all will be working on and collecting the info with the 100, I mean, with the uh, b bill it's the exact same schema that we developed as I was a graduate student at Kansas that I am now using to focus only on short stories, not novels. You all see what I did? Just basically took the thing, replaced it, same thing. So I want to just really emphasize structuring data, structuring information, and what you can do by structuring info. Now, don't pass me down. <laughs> can I can, can say, yeah, it, yes. One of the things that's it's interesting to point out here is that because when you talk to me about it, I'm talking to the people who did those anthologies, Richard Barksdale, mm -hmm. talking to Jerry Ward. So having some human knowledge into 
he had to lean in on this as well. And because people know stuff you don't know. Mm -hmm. So there's also that element of it, and it gives them a chance to look up stuff and pull their anthologies that they have that nobody that, that are long since out of print. Yeah, so like me, real character. So I want to also give a lot of a lot of love to Alicia Griffin too, because Alicia did all of the inventory in HBW collection. And surprisingly, y'all, even after finishing graduate school, I have to all constantly return to HBW just to get access to books that I cannot find in library. What about um, curious publications? What about it? You know, did you include? Um, is there a way to look at? The changing content of the over time. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you know, it's funny. You can look at that just one the physical. I can't even get over because I was I was looking. I look at a lot of poetry anthologies and how it's it's done there, which is even it's kind of worse if you're one of the people collecting it because the poetry, you know, poetry is just this far more poems, right? Because they're easier, not easier to do, but it's like people will publish poems in smaller books and short stories is a different economic thing, right? But yeah, just to say that they shift, yeah, Negro Caravan, all of that is in here. But I think they do shift over time. Like uh, we get all the way up to, like we were saying, Dr. War's anthology, the Norton anthology. Yeah, you do get to see them shifting and changing what gets <laughs> emphasized more after a particular period. Uh, so that's it. I was going to slow down too and just say, like, what questions you all have up to this point? Because I feel yeah, like we're moving, yeah. so we need to go much um, slower. I have, have some thoughts about maybe why, but I'm curious about your thinking around why these books aren't included in searchable spaces. Um, mm -hmm. as, <laughs> I mean, like, so part of it, I understand, like, the presence of like writing um, and maybe it not being universally accessible next year. But just out of curiosity, like what what did you arrive at as a relationship that led you to this thing when you like self uh collective day ourselves? So you know, I'm gonna say this from my perspective, then I wanna pass over to my brother who can fill in a few gaps for me on like literary history. I started college in two thousand six. The only anthology I used was the Northern Anthology. And then by that time, I think it was in the second edition. That's the only one I used. And I always find it so funny because later stuff like, you didn't check out this one. This is what I'm talking about, what was I received, you know, as a student, you know, in, in this growing field, so to speak. But my thing is with that, one of the reasons I think is just simply because when things fall out of print, what's seen is valuable in some types of ways. And I just think in some ways, the Norton just has a lot, the Norton as a company has a lot of money to just really, uh, really, really push that book. Sure. Because when we think about it online, you can find stuff about Google. I mean, you can find on Google, you can find a lot of stuff about Norton, you know, call and response about Black Southern voices and these things. It was before the 90s. Those are anthologies I just cannot find. Yeah. To give an example, yeah, the economics of it, everybody in this room right now, I could get you all to go on your laptop. You could email Norton and say, I'm thinking about possibly, maybe considering using the Norton and they will send every one of us a copy. Like you couldn't, like who else has that kind of money? Like you, you know what I mean? You know, like so every book that you and I know about quite often is happening like that. You know what I mean? Where they, so that I would say um, that's one. But another one is just, yeah, like I think that a print rounds are much smaller. You know, it's all kind of reason where you get, and then you just didn't have the resources. For me, the other example would be, I was a student at, for grad school at Penn State. And I'll never forget, I was getting ready to go on a trip to Ghana. So I went down this road in the library, in Penn State's library, and they have all, all of these books on Ghana, like very new books. I went to Ghana, and I was in the library at Ghana, and they had less new books in the entire library than Penn State had on this road on Ghana. And that just was like a real clear sense to me of like disproportionate kinds of like resources. And you know, hey, I did Penn State is okay, but you know, they not a big friend of Ghana necessarily. So if they got more and they're not even thinking about it. But it was the same for me with African American. I went to Tougaloo Play. You went to Tougaloo. We went mm -hmm. to Tougaloo College. We love Tougaloo, right? But Tougaloo just did not have the kind of books that they had at Penn State. And I say this all the time about the universities. I mean, if you're at Penn State and you're talking about, if you could compliment the librarians, hey, you all have all of these things. And they're going to say, they say, yeah, but we're not like, they're going to they're gonna say, we don't have as much as the University of Michigan. We don't have as much as Yale. You know, if you go over, I remember being doing an exchange at NYU. 
And I was like, wow, this library is fabulous. You don't have as much as Columbia. So, you know, like it's interesting how folks are constantly looking at different universities, thinking about their resources. Uh, so I think the resource thing is one reason it didn't happen. And then two, we got to throw in the race issue of race and racism. Like Google just was not a priority. It was not specialists in African-American literature sitting in the room when Google said, we're going to scan things. And so it just was, you know, there was no difference between this black, right, and everybody. It was like, what was available? So I think that's it. So like you were saying, filling in the gaps, uh, which is why it's so important that we're in here thinking about this, because you all are going to be filling in gaps, not just doing a technical thing, but also saying, like, this was different and that different. What's another question? And you know, while we're changing this around, I want to say another question about to speak to this, why am I starting here? It's the simple idea is I realized I didn't understand a broader literary history of African American short fiction. You know, oftentimes I am relying on particular things. Um, uh, how, um, okay, let me just give you one fine to example, uh, exemplify my point. Oftentimes I heard after, uh, you know, Alice Walker published this, um, published the article in Miss Magazine about Zora Neale Hurston, all of a sudden she came back to life. All of these types of things she was including in thousands constantly, constantly. And what I've been saying, that's not really true. The 90s. That's when actually people got on Zora Neale Hurston again and she's included in it thousands of times and time and time again. It's interesting to me because even in some of our most celebrated black anthologies that were published during the 70s, no Zora Neale Hurston can be found whatsoever. The book was just being reprinted. Mm-hmm. It was just being reprinted. So that made me start to think about a few things. If I discover a writer today, <laughs> how long does it take for them to get in thousands of eyes and actually include it in the canon? <laughs> or whatever, canon again, canon the first time. Whatever. <laughs> so that's what I'm trying to kind of think about in some types of ways. So I'm really interested in thinking about the linguistic aspects of short stories. But first, and this is, I only had this knowledge after working on the Black Book Project so long that I have to really create a description of what's actually going on in everything. Like, how can I actually pull on one particular record that uh, gives a 100-year publishing history of African-American anthologies? This starts with the New Negro in 1925, by the way. Like, that was my starting point. I said I had to pick somewhere to start. But I got to about 70 anthologies, and then again, I had to call my brother because there was no way. We, we had to scrabble to get about 30 more anthologies mm-hmm. out of that. So how are you doing? Oh, what else? Other questions? Sorry. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, Oh, sorry. She was saying, how do you find out? And tell me if I'm getting right. She was like, how do you find out where different authors' papers are? Yeah. It was very interesting that you mentioned that because I was I was thinking that one of the things that we need to, to do is to create a database of exactly that. Where are archives housed? Mm-hmm. And people need to know that. You can dig and find. Most of the, yeah. Mostly people think Beinecke, if they think of, or they think Fisk, or they think a few other places. But we do need a, 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 you know, a record and an inventory of where stuff is. Mm-hmm. We do need an inventory, particularly where lesser known materials are and may not be processed yeah. but are still available if people want to do the level of research which means they have to go in to on the floor of the boxes which is what a lot of people have had to do over the years to get what they want so we need you don't have it in the book yeah so not one single place the answer is no yeah the ropes and family papers at Howard. yeah somebody was asking about Baraka and I was telling them which which, because Barack is at Columbia, his thing is at Columbia, his thing's at Howard, his things are, yeah, he had them a few different places, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you began, I think you said, you started with the anthologies in the 20th century? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why did you not start with anthologies uh, created by black people? After 1865, in the Reconstruction period, mm-hmm. because I I have not gone through these, but I would hazard that you might find in these anthologies 
which had very little to me, short story. Mm. Access, access. <laughs> and I'll say like where I actually started with this again, I want to start with 100 and I tried to think about where am I actually starting, but the thing is I really had to just start with what was available in the HBW talk, like to be completely honest with you, because one Around, I was like, I was able to find po a lot of poetry anthologies that were, you know, published during the 19th century. But I was specifically looking for collections that included short fiction. That was a struggle to find, even in terms of just like googling things. That's what I thought it was going to be easy to first start with Google. But I had to go back literally to the bookshelves that Alicia told over uh, <laughs> one long summer. And the idea is, Dr. Grant has so many books, so many various anthologies, and that was my starting. Mm -hmm. But you I let me feel like one gap here. There is a project that tried to address that concern, and that is we know that in the 19th century, uh, African American fiction was uh, serialized. Mm -hmm. So the Black Periodical Fiction Project was a pro was paralleled HBW in terms of its beginning. It just didn't have the longevity. Mm -hmm. But the Black Periodical Fiction Project was an effort to create an inventory. It became, it was on CD-ROM eventually, because yeah. it predates you know, where we are now. And they tried to create an index of all black short fiction that appeared in black periodicals or serials in the 19th century. So that, there is a body of information, but it is not the anthology. It is serialized fiction as an inventory, as an index. So you can find an index to that. Those stories are virtually unknown. There are a lot of them. They were all in black, black magazines, black newspapers in the 19th century. So if you bring, you have to do the collation between the newspapers, the magazines, and then the in index of the stories. There's a lot of cross deck indexing you have to do to get what you need. But you would have difficulty finding anthology. Second point, the, the nomenclature for what was happening in the 19th century is the yearbook and the annual. People use annuals and yearbooks to compile information by black writers. And so they are not necessarily, the language is not anthology, but there are other forms. So you're looking for something that is pretty much a 20th century phenomenon, but the process of collecting information goes back earlier, but it's in a different form. And so the annuals and the yearbooks, book clubs did them, lots of people did them. So you have to look at that history. So there's a lot of different kind of histories that you have to put on the table. Yes. A publishing house. I was looking specifically, so yes, in terms of methods, just to get this together, I was looking particularly for something that was published by a publishing house starting with the New York in 1975. <laughs> of course, I know I probably could extend my search and go before that, but I wanted to kind of just start with something because I was interested in thinking what stories do students most likely encounter in classes. That is kind of one of the things that I was thinking about because I would like to say even though I'm thinking about this in terms of collecting data, I was more so interested to say like for instance in a survey course and even I, I, I do this as well, I'm going to mention Native Song. I'm going to mention Their Eyes Were Watching God but because of the, uh, the economy of time, we're probably going to use a short story instead in class for the semester instead of using novels because it just might be impossible to do that. Uh, thoroughly, impossible to do that thoroughly, excuse me, excuse me, it's possible, <laughs> thoroughly, pardon me, yes. Yes, I'm sorry. So, we're going to read the ad, I'll read the question of the ad, um, so, we're going to read the ad. No, just meant novels. And the only reason I was doing that is just because I want to start somewhere to actually be able to, with a, in a sense, finish it. Because the idea is, I know even collecting anthologies by themselves was, it, I thought that was going to be so easy. I thought that was going to be um, but one thing I do want to say, why, why, why am I talking about this project with the Big 7 and what we're talking about, Bita, is because collectively you all, how can you all participate in something that is collective that you can do in order to collect metadata about black writing? I don't want us to over-assume that with these novels that you all will be working with, there is ample information online. So in some instances, I notice things in some instances, people are saying, like, well, why are we just collecting information? I'm going to get to the sexy stuff using the digital tools and this and this and this. We have to create a record for African-American literature first. And it's not fair. But so what? 
You know what I'm saying? What are you going to do? You have to create a record first just so we can actually properly assess what we have, what we don't have to take the Project window selected duplicate two or four. Okay. I, I, I have to say that I don't know what that is. Sorry. <laughs> This one's the I want to just show this with you all just because I remember you all, I'm just on phase one of this project, phase one of just identifying what are the most frequently anthologized short stories. Now, I want to give you all the idea of time about this, okay? With the 100 Novels Project, which eventually turns to be built, I mentioned at the beginning Crystal Bolson and Gordon and Williams because when we were working on that, we had a metadata spreadsheet of, I mean, we had a spreadsheet of over, I think, about 50 columns. And the thing is, when I was talking about Google not necessarily having info on black writers, it's because we had to individually go to the stacks at KU's libraries and Watson and these various things just to figure out stuff from the actual book jackets. When was it published? Who was it published by? What publisher? This and that and so forth. So when I'm thinking about this recently with this, I had a little bit of help in completing this project. And I want to think about how long does it take to collect metadata. This entire project, even creating the visualization, it took 305 hours. 305 hours divided by four people, myself, Jade Harris, and Rebecca Newsom, and the data, metadata librarian that you gave Keith Osmo Wilson. Williams. So the reason why I'm thinking about this is because for you all's project, we've divided you all into groups, and I kind of want to just do a little reassuring things about the groups, okay? You're not supposed to necessarily just stay in the groups forever. Hopefully, after you start thinking about information, finding information, combining your information, you might find insights of one particular thing that you want to study. However, in order to get to that position, we have to start doing things collectively. Divide and come. Do you all understand what we're saying? Particularly, when we think about biography, the group is uh, focusing on biography. A lot of the stuff in this, uh, a lot of the uh, actual novels in this corpus, we don't know where the novel, where the novelists were born. We don't know where their birth dates are, when their death dates are, and those things are going to be so very important if we're going to do any type of comparative analysis. Similarly, when we're thinking about the actual bibliographic information about it, how many of these novels actually in the data that are actually cited are actually written about? I think that's so very important to think about what's actually written about because I want to pass this over to you to talk about the idea of recovery work and writers in the camp. Mm -hmm. Particularly for a junior scholar to focus on recovery. Yeah, I was going to hope, again, though, I always keep thinking more questions. Though, oh, yeah. I say, okay. oh, sorry, I want to really take more questions. Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> yes. I have a question. What's hobby trust? Oh. Oh, Yeah, because that, that, that was going to be my question. I mean, if you talk about triangulating information, is it possible that an extensive database of newspapers, particularly African American newspapers, might have a book review or a publication date, or something, yeah. something that would let you fill in some of the elements? Of the That's how we actually did. That's, That's what we actually right. had to do. That's what I think how to trust. No, again, I'm saying this should be the case. This is not. <laughs> this is not the case. This is not. And I understand because this was a lot of my frustration early on as a graduate student because I'm seeing all of these projects explode and stuff like this in the world. And I'm like, yo, I'm still just collecting descriptive information. So on the one hand, it looks like, oh, let's just collect these stuff in a spreadsheet. That's a little logo. I'm like, yo, we have to create a record first of just what's available before we can even proceed. And that's been just like kind of a, a big thing that I want to focus on. But yeah, let's, let's I, I kind of want to get these questions like So any more questions about that? Uh, well, you know my background in museums and interest in like library science and I don't know exactly what it would be, but I'm thinking what states might go in like a museum or uh, an archive have this kind of work because I see it overlapping. And the reason why I bring it up is because it is so labor intensive. So I would imagine some 
somewhere like a museum or whatever in terms of collaboration, getting mm. in other institutions to support this kind of work. Mm. Because I'm thinking like, if, for example, if you were going to do an exhibit on like French Caribbean, this kind of thing would be perfect to put in like, you know, like an exhibition. But mm. I would imagine you need more resources, you need more collaboration, more help. Mm. So. Yeah, I would say, too, you all remember with maybe, if not, there's a essay by Barbara Christian called The Race for Theory. Remember that? And she was just talking about how, like, there was just this huge rush in the field for everybody to really get into theory. I sometimes think data is like that. Like, there's this r- race. Yeah, 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 high theory. There you go. But there's, like, this uh, race for high data, a large data. So I would tell you all, like, my big thing, and it's probably just kind of the way I operate in the world. It's like just to tell yourself, like, what kind of small projects could I do to start off? Uh, as opposed to like really, like it is going to take a lot of hours if you're doing a big thing. But one of my personal things is just to do uh, my own book collection at home. Like, and it's been taking me longer than I thought it was. Not like I have a huge, yeah. I do that a lot. <laughs> but I'll start doing little small, small portions of that thing. Something I've been doing since 2010. I know at the end of every single year, I'm going to put out a blog into talking about, here you go to major highlights in African American poetry. And when I say that, like, they're like national news African American poetry, I'm really talking about 10 big things that happen. But I think when you start thinking like that, like, so I did that over the last, oh, close to 10 years now. So when I started, it seemed like it was really small because in 2011, I just had 20 items. But now, you know, it's far more. I think sometimes that's something I would really encourage you all, like not to get too caught up into, I mean, you end up getting caught up to get a room like this, then we had to do some large projects, right, to convince uh, funders to uh, actually believe in it. But I think just to understand some of the things, it made a lot of sense to me to like start. Like I'm telling you all, we only get here in part with me starting with a collection of 50 volumes of poetry I got, and then start building from there. I started working with anthologies as a grad student uh, back in 99, Ooh, 99, and I was thinking about like, oh, here goes, uh, Penn State just happened to have a lot of anthology, African American anthology. I just happened to land in the right place um, by coincidence to be there. And so I think those kinds of things, like thinking like that, because I wouldn't think about things like Excel when I started. So it was uh, really interesting now to come after the fact and start doing it. So anyway, I just wanted to make sure to reassure you all really on that idea the starting small can matter in a lot of ways for you. Absolutely, because oftentimes we hear the buzzword big data. I always like to push it and say, what I'm doing is small data. It's <laughs> small data. It's relationships between black writers and other black writers. That's all I'm interested in right now. Again, that might not seem like such a casting a wide net, but again, within this anthology I'm looking at over two, I mean within this data set, I'm still observing uh, various characteristics about over 200 short story writers. 200 short story writers in May about, uh, I'm not sure how many short stories, but the idea is starting small is definitely okay. And this is why I think that we're kind of good with starting with this group. And we kind of want to just, again, emphasize this part, what can we do collectively by everybody finding various information to contribute to a larger data set? I think that's really the biggest thing I kind of want to drive with this in terms of showing this visualization. Labor is definitely a part of this, but particularly for the novels in the HBW collection, I do know there's a lot of biographical, there's just a lot of basic information missing, not by any fault of like HBW in terms of collecting, but some of these writers have just been overlooked throughout history. They've just been overlooked, and as a result, there's no real records of them going on. Oh, who? Uh, well, one, I'll say this, assume that you're going to make a couple of mistakes along the way. That's one, I always. But then, two, just going back and checking. Well, I cringe sometimes when I look at my blog because I, like, have these little typos here and there, and I'm like, oh, my God, like, people saw this. And uh, so it's just like what any project would do. And I think it's just this checking and rechecking. Um, I'm trying to think of some famous po- poets. Well, 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 go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Coded so that yeah. everybody's individualized. Well, I just want to say, in general, you're just going to do a lot of data. You're just going to do a lot of 
of yeah, you know, your information and reassessing that. Because one of the biggest things that I found is this, and I might get in trouble for some embalsing people who are just sitting here like this. I started to notice that there are a lot of errors and then thousands of things have been repeated over and yeah. over and over again. It seems like to me, I was like, if one person just taking an thousand, then the error just started repeating itself mm -hmm. in terms of like simple things such as birthdays. I know people are thinking, you must be talking about Zoe Hurst. No, not talking about her. <laughs> the other writers whose birthdays were just, it was erroneous, mm -hmm. a lot of erroneous information. Actual anthology. The racial identity. The racial yeah. identity, because I want to point to this part visual data pain you to 13% of the time, and I can't take too much credit for that. But Jay going through open refining and finding so much information, literally going to just fact check. I told Jay, and this was ambitious at first, we need to find like two other sources to confirm this. Mm -hmm. Then we just started speeding up. <laughs> yeah, remember, uh, this is the part that's off there. A couple of things that stand out. Remember, Lance, uh, Ralph Ellison? For years, they thought his birth year was one year, and then it was just in literally the last like six or seven years we realized he, it wasn't that year. And then another one, again, this is stuff that won't ever show up in data sets. Mari Evans, like everybody who was black in African American literature, you knew that you were not supposed to mention her birth year in print. Original. Like yeah, yeah, you really just want so go look at the Nord, the first Nord. Like they know it, like they literally put somebody who's born before her and somebody after, and they put their year, but they don't put her year. That's because Gates knew she would come out. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, so it's like interesting. And all, but now, so that was interesting at that time, but then it became confusing when, when she passed away. Everybody was trying to figure out like, when was she really born, you know? And so it was just a hard, and they would even have celebrations for her at different points in her life. And she knew that that wasn't her birthday. But, you know, you didn't know, so. Alicia, did she tell the truth? Did Mari Evans tell the truth about her birthday? You didn't ask. She knew. <laughs> even though that we, that the data set does account for those types I mean, so for instance, Charles Chestnut is definitely by age the oldest, uh, the old, I mean, the most frequently anthologized short story writer. However, James Baldwin's short story by far, Sunny's Blues, is the most frequently anthologized short story ever. And again, I try to look at that as because Baldwin is definitely not the same age as Chestnut, Hurston, or Wright. But the idea is his story has seemed to surpass in terms of what people have been thinking. I know we also think this little thing about dates the 70s is this big explosion of publications, and to an extent that's true. But I've noticed after collecting short stories, particularly, uh, the 90s is when I see so many particular anthologies. And again, I think this coincides with like the race for theory, signifying monkey, all these things that Dr. Graham was doing, raise the visibility, Dr. Graham and Dr. Warwick was raise the visibility of Richard White. So the 90s is one of the things that I saw as more of uh, an explosion in terms of diverse and where uh, anthologies being published. I was wondering, why do you think that you black kind of information? Yeah, well, it necessarily at first it wasn't necessarily for users in terms of actually using this to sift through things. If you have particular information about the publishing histories of short stories, this is what this was created for originally. One of the things that you can pull out is one of the things that I did is identify who are the most frequently, who are the top, uh, who are the most frequently published writers. In addition, a few other things you might look at if you kind of look at some of the tabs, you can also find out, well, which black writers appear in American anthologies? Because when we start thinking that, there is a bigger discrepancy then about who gets included. Out of those seven writers, excluding Langston Hughes, those are the only ones who are going to appear with uh, frequency in American anthologies. So various things you can consider by looking at the various tabs and categories. So what I want to say about Collecting data, what two variables can we put side by side to create a various uh, uh, create a comparison? If I want to look at the big seven, I think about the most frequently anthologized writers by 1970, I am thinking about a big four. Charles Chestnut, Richard Wright, Ralph Ellison, James Baldwin. That's it at that point. So again, we can look at various things, various sections of the data set. Even though this contains um, entries by over uh, from 100 anthologies, you don't necessarily have to use the entire data set to conduct your research. Which brings me to another point. What types of questions do we impose on the data sometimes? I think sometimes it's very important. Um, so when I was working on the collection, developing the metadata for the first time for people, um, and this goes back to the point that was made, uh, the most helpful for those really obscure books that I found almost nothing about 
where, where newspaper reviews. Mm -hmm. uh, even, even places, even journal articles that said, there is literally nothing on this author. I went ahead and found stuff on the author from newspaper, mm -hmm. like African American periodicals, early 20th century. But my other question was, the other source that I found for these lesser known authors were somewhat disreputable, <laughs> rare books, uh, website on the internet where, where people put up uh, rare books for auction and whatnot and they have little blurbs that this author was born in Virginia yeah. and so on and so here. Yeah. Now, what do we do with information that we <laughs> find like that but we are not completely sure of? Do we at all put that into the Excel sheet or don't? I think it's a starting point. Yeah. I think if you read that as just a starting point no one you have to invest together with it. Yeah, you put it in there you put a note mm -hmm. card. A note card, yeah. And I used to just put it in red font. I mean, well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But, but then it's, it's still doable then. I mean, yes. You yeah, like, I, like I'm saying, like things change so much with any data you, you get. Like, I mean, like, the, like I say, we, the example we've given, like everybody knows that her stem for a long period. We thought she was born in this one time. She wasn't, and you know, things mm -hmm. like that. So, But I sometimes like to even capture some of those errors and explain yeah. why. Like, I'm like, you know, it's always become a big thing to talk about why did why did first and say uh, feel the need to lie, and it's because of a thing that's still going on in our culture where like folks are like looking for the new writers, and she said, "Well, I better be new and as you know, young as Lance and Hughes is." Uh, if people asking, so I think those kind of things. Uh, what are the, okay. a couple of points just in terms of uh, you know trajectory that, that um, it's possible to get information in different kinds of ways. So you're talking about, Arn Arnav is talking about the rare book catalogs. So those rare book catalogs are a second stage, maybe second stage or third stage, of rare bookstores. So the Strand Bookstore in New York was a place that had no catalog, and you knew when you went to the Strand Bookstore, it was going to be an all-day business. <laughs> yeah. And you'd have your dust mask on because it was extremely dusty. If you have allergies, you're going to be sick in an hour. But the books were not in any kind of order. But they had every rare book, every they bought everything, mm -hmm. and writers would go to the Strand Book to find things they hadn't seen. The second phase was these catalogs, and we started looking at those catalogs and getting books, and I think the biggest purchase we did was a set of the boys' books. And oh, I think wow. they were maybe Somebody donated money. We bought a five hundred dollar book, you know. So, festival um, book, silver fleece. Mm -hmm. So it was. It we do have to trust. It's what I'm saying to a certain extent. That kind of information. So no information will go unrecorded if you find it. But you do have to make a note that you need to. You talk about triangulate. If I can mm -hmm. find, and I know I told you that. Mm -hmm. Three ways of verifying so I stand <laughs> guilty, guilty. Three ways of verifying that something exists. Historians do that all the time. <laughs> you know, they want to check something, but if they have three sources, they will say, okay, I can write it in a book. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying we need to, we have to do that kind of triangulation and some mm -hmm. to some degree. I was say, uh, go ahead. I was going to say, again, we're asking why did I start focusing on short stories? Why did I focus on anthologies? After focusing on novels of uh, relatively unknown writers, that influenced my decision to say, hey, I need to focus on stuff where I can actually be able to find information. About. And I was thinking anthologies, people who are oftentimes anthologized, people are already oftentimes written about. They're written about in scholarly context. So this is, again, I came to this thinking in 2015 only after spending five years working with this project. So I'm just trying to explain some of these decisions that I have made in terms of why I worked on short stories and why now I think it's crucial for a group of this size to start tackling and finding information about the novels and the HBWs of the next. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now nah, it's interesting you said that too because I, I think a lot about one of the cautions I always have about data is that sometimes when we put it like this, it doesn't equate for like how much weight something has. Like you could put this in here and it'll seem like things are equal, but then you all know in the real world, they're not, right? So we could say, uh, I don't know. I mean, we could take any writer and it's the writers you all are doing. I struggle with this because on the one hand, when I'm at conferences and I'm in a very African-American lit space, it's a, a strong imperative to like uh, address uh, 
understudied writers. But then the reason I'm, I struggle on it, I know how I got into the field. I took a class before I took a survey course. I took a course on Richard Wright. And like I got into the field on one of our most known writers. And then I moved to writers who weren't as known. So I always think it's interesting like that when it's uh, like, how does one go into a field is what I'm always thinking about. Do you go in to a smaller, like a smaller set of unknown writers or do you start? And yeah, it's just a struggle that I have. And because it was fascinating for me, I went into the field like that. I took the course of Dr. Ward on Richard Wright. And then the next year I took a course, a survey course. So I was reading the field through Richard Wright. And I was just fortunate because I know some people may have taken a class on Hurston or somebody may have taken it on this. In my own university, they end you with the major writer. You go through your survey courses, blah, blah, blah. And then at the very end, you can take the Toni Morrison course or you can take the Shakespeare course, whatever, you know, like on a single author. So it's just something to think about, I think, whenever we go into these. Um, so the, the writers in this data set that you all are working with are not as well known. So I wonder what that means. There's something you should always caution yourself about. Like, hey, however you go into any data, you should always be like raising those things. And we, and we definitely are thinking about the idea of creating this record of Professor Bailey at the first uh, accord is because I couldn't ever even acknowledge or observe these things unless I had some sort of publication. Record. For instance, my graduate student Jade is working on her thesis after taking the subset of all of the data we collected to just focus on how certain anthologies uh, presented women writers. So again, yes, we are trying to account for these gaps, but I guess what we're trying to say why we could why Vita is so important is because we have to work collectively to at first establish a record of all of this information that we have available. And again, on some of the webinars, I think when we were thinking about, oh, what are our research projects supposed to be? What we, I don't know if we're supposed to have all of those questions answered at this phase, at this particular point, because what record are we pulling on to basically see, okay, these are the novels that are the most even though these are relatively unknown novels, these novels are known more than the novel by, you know, XYZ over here. These types of questions, we don't really have a broad view of our field because I've started, I, I, I'm a this impression. Again, remember, I started college in 2006, so I feel like African American literature was handed to me. When we say <laughs> African American literature, we, you know, one might say uh, something written by a black writer. From my conception as a student, I was like, African American literature for me means Gordon oh, Hurston, Tony Morris, and Richard Wright, <laughs> like the major writers. Because oftentimes while I was in college, uh, until I got to Dr. Graham, actually, I was really only reading major writers. And I just want to always emphasize on how that was handed to me as a student, simply because I wonder how much resources, how much information is available. Yes. Um, one thing that's great about um, us not being able to answer all the questions about what research projects come out of this, and um, um, to our earlier point about um, uh, small data versus big data. When thinking about our projects or other projects that work, you know, at what point do you report out? Like, mm. as you're creating the record, like, should you wait until you have the record and then you're applying it to um, some particular analysis, or, or do you report out and say, here I am uh, thinking about anthologies and I had to do this, uh, here's my methodology, or do you kind of wait until you have the methodology? A real quick question, I'll let Howard answer that. I know for the 100 Novels Black Book Project, we started this series called Black Literary Suites to start reporting on our findings along the way. And this was just something we were doing to show. Hey, we, we are doing DH work over here, but we are not finished with at least collecting our records. So we reported, we tried to create these various iterations of various suites, as we call them, to show, hey, these are our findings. And we always noticed that New York was a popular destination around, I think, the dates and things like this with the novels in our collection. So, yes, that's so the point. Like, uh, signal yes. That you are doing it. And, yeah. But, but not finished, yeah. But we're not finished. But this is what we've seen so far. Yeah. And and so when we first started HBW, before we got to the digital stage, we were writing our original grants and we had to learn something called verification techniques. How you verify the existence of this author and some certain biographical information, including race. So we published an article that included information about how to verify. It was in a very, it was in a journal that was specific to that kind of information. It's an old article when people every now and then find it and say, my God, I wish I had this 10 years ago. And it's really, it's probably about 20 years old now, but it was just publishing a way to identify what you were looking for and the 
and the places that you can go now at that point 20 years ago. So that steps along the way become very important because you're sharing the knowledge with other people who are doing pieces of work like that. Mm -hmm. uh, again, this whole idea of this kind of work is that it's not you're holding on to the knowledge, it's opening up the possibility of information that's going to be expanded. So it's a different way of thinking, mm -hmm. not owning knowledge, but sharing knowledge. Yes. And so it has to have a life, a shelf life in different ways along the way. But it's interesting, it, the question you were raising, it's been a huge argument over the last couple of weeks in <laughs> DH about yeah. that very thing, because there was just a one author kind of charged and kind of critiqued many DH folks. She said, hey, you all are uh, given information on exploratory projects and you sh should not do that. She said, you're receiving funding and this and that. But then on the other hand, like, I don't know, like the, the other argument folks could make is like, well, but we need to have like, like bits and pieces to even understand where we're going. And she even, uh, the, that scholar, uh, Nan Da, I think that's how you pronounce her name. One of her things is like, she's like, you all are turning like published research and the proposal, grant proposals into published research. And it's just such a hard line to say it like that. So that's not new. That's what they do with the scientists all the time. It's not new. It's not new. They are abstracting it all the time. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. All the time. Yeah, like we're we're talking about it now and that we actually have to uh, come to a close. But I will say, uh, for me, I'm so glad that I was able to experiment early on uh, before I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And in a public way on my blog, I'm so glad that I was able to do that. Uh, because I couldn't have got into some of the things. It's not the same as if I, when I was doing different kinds of articles. And I would also say uh, the thing I would have you all do just for yourself, like track how you're evolving, the way you're thinking about the field is slightly changing. For me, I would say it changes a lot. I think in larger data sets than I ever did like when I was coming up through the field. Like now I think in such like bigger terms about it. But just say like I'll think about more books. Like you all hear our number we keep throwing around is 100. So many of my projects are like, okay, 100 is enough for me to start thinking about. But that's not something I always did. You know, I've been going to panel the last few days where people say, I'm just looking at one novel. And that kind of threw me off in a way because I'm so used to thinking about uh, other ones. Like I started thinking of it in different terms. And I say 100, there are folks who are deep in the data and they were like, 100 is not nearly enough to know anything at all. So anyway. Well, you can build on, I hope you would cite me, but I will just say of my, my, my opinion of that, I'm just of a Napster generation. I, a Napster, the music champ, sharing, <laughs> sharing. <laughs> yeah, I'm just of Napster generation, and I always thought when I'm looking for this information, as I told you all, I couldn't find info on these, I'll wish someone would share the info with me. So with that being said, I've made this publicly available so people can either grow it, expand it, you can use sections and pieces of it, but it is credited with myself, Jade, and Rebecca Newsom, the other graduate. Okay, so let's move back to the subtle thing and not like discussing the top five. Yeah, whatever. Like, for me, why you supposed to think you all work and create on Yeah, I wish more people created things and shared them, particularly on like these kind of bibliographies and that were available online in a way, because I think it would, it would have cut down some of the yeah. time. Um, let me tell you what we're about to do. Thank you, gentlemen, for. <laughs>